Liberalism Section The Black Slave and the White Servant From Grotius to Locke While it stimulated the development of racial chattel slavery and created an unprecedented, unbridgeable gulf between whites and peoples of color, the self-government of civil society triumphed, waving the flag of liberty and the struggle against despotism. Between these two elements, which emerged together during a unique twin birth, a relationship full of tensions and contradictions was established. Such a celebration of liberty, which was bound up with the reality of an unprecedented absolute power, can clearly be interpreted as an ideology. But however mystificatory it might be, ideology is never null. In fact, its mystificatory function cannot even be conceived without some incidence in concrete social reality. And still less can ideology be regarded as synonymous with conscious falsehood. Were that to be the case, it would not succeed in inspiring people and generating real social activity, and would be condemned to impotence. The theorists and agents of the liberal revolutions and movements were moved by a powerful, convinced pathos of liberty, and precisely for that reason, they displayed embarrassment at the reality of slavery. Obviously, in a majority of cases, such embarrassment did not push them to the point of questioning the property on which the wealth and social influence of the class protagonists in the struggle for self-government of civil society were based. As regards England, the course was taken that removed slavery in the strict sense to a geographical area remote from the metropolis, situated at the edge of the civilized world, where, precisely on account of the proximity and pressure of barbarous circumstances, the spirit of liberty was not manifested in all its purity, unlike in England proper, the true homeland, the promised land of liberty. However, this was a conclusion reached via a route marked by oscillations and contradictions of various kinds. In Grotius, the color barrier is not yet visible that separates the fate reserved for blacks from the condition to which the poorest layers of the white population can be subjected. We read, quote, Perfect and utter slavery is that which obliges a man to serve his master all his life long, for diet and other common necessaries, which indeed, if it be thus understood, and confined within the bounds of nature, has nothing too hard and severe in it. However, slavery was not the only form of servitus, but only the most ignoble, kind of subjection. End quote. There was also servitus imperfecta, peculiar among others to serfs and mercenarii, or wage laborers. Thus, labor as such was subsumed under the category of service, servitus, or subjection, subjectio. Obviously there is a difference between the two forms of service and subjection. While it violated, quote, natural reason, or the rules of full and complete justice, i.e. the norms of morality, on the basis of the legislation in force in some countries, the master could kill his slave with impunity, and hence exercise a right of life and death over him. This was something not found in the sphere of the servitus imperfecta, and the labor relationship that employed mercenarii or wage laborers. Nevertheless, we are dealing with a particular species of the single genus, that is, service or subjection. The boundary between the various species is fluid. For example, of the apprentices, apprentici, in England, it was noted that they, quote, come nearest to the state of slavery during their apprenticeship, that is to say, to the condition of slaves proper. On the other hand, by way of atoning for a crime, one could be condemned to labor and to render one's services either as a slave or as an individual subjected to some form of, quote, imperfect slavery. Compared with Grotius, Locke was concerned to distinguish more rigorously between the various kinds of service. Elements of continuity are certainly not lacking. Speaking of wage labor and the contract that establishes it, the English philosopher wrote, quote, a free man makes himself a servant to another. As we can see, labor as such continues to be subsumed under the category of service. In fact, the contract 
introduces the wage laborer, quote, into the family of his master and under the ordinary discipline thereof, end quote. This discipline was in fact very different from the unlimited power that characterized the relationship of slavery and defined the, quote, perfect condition of slavery. Grotius's distinction between servitus perfecta and servitus imperfecta reappears in broad outline. But Locke urges us not to confuse servant and slave. Grotius compared the slave to a perpetual hireling, or a wage laborer bound for the duration of his natural term to the same master. By contrast, Locke stressed that we are dealing with two different statuses. In addition to being temporary, the power exercised by the master over a servant, quote, is no greater than what is contained in the contract between them. If, on the one hand, this made the condition of the servant better, on the other, it rendered that of the slave proper, manifestly worse. Shaking off the moral inhibitions of Grotius, who called on the master to respect not only the life, but also the specificity of his slave, Locke endlessly stressed that the master exercises over the slave an, quote, absolute dominion, absolute power, a legislative power of life and death, an arbitrary power encompassing life itself, end quote. At this point, the slave tends to lose his human characteristics and becomes reduced to a thing and a chattel, as emerges in particular from the reference to the planters of the East Indies who possess, quote, slaves or horses on the basis of a regular purchase, and this by money or bargain. Without any hint of criticism, Locke engaged in a conjunction that signifies a firm, indignant denunciation in abolitionist literature. This applies to Mirabeau, who, as we shall see, compared the condition of American slaves with, quote, our horses and our mules, and to Marx, who observed in Capital, quote, the slave owner buys his worker in the same way as he buys his horse, end quote. Locke marks a turning point theoretically. Sometimes freed by their masters, black slaves were long subjected to a condition not markedly dissimilar from that of indentured servants, that is, temporary white semi-slaves on a contractual basis. And it is this ambiguity that finds expression in the text of Grotius, who can hence also apply the category of contract to servitus perfecta. In Locke, by contrast, we can read the development which chattel slavery and racial slavery began to undergo from the late 17th century. A whole series of English colonies in America enacted laws intended to make it clear that the slave's conversion did not entail his emancipation. Locke expressed himself thus in 1660 when, referring to Paul of Tarsus, he asserted that, quote, conversion did not dissolve any of those obligations they were tied in before. The gospel continued them in the same condition and under the same civil obligations under which it found them. The married were not to leave their consorts, nor the servant freed from his master. End quote. In complete conformity with this theoretical position, in the draft Carolina Constitution, Locke reiterated the irrelevance of possible conversion to Christianity for the condition of the slave. And, once again, the element of novelty emerges. Although rejecting an abolitionist interpretation of Christianity, Grotius repeatedly appealed to Christian literature to underscore the common humanity of servant and master, both of them subject to the Father in heaven, and hence in a relationship with each other that was in some sense one of fraternity. The second treatise of government is concerned instead to make it clear that the principle of equality applies exclusively to, quote, creatures of the same species and rank, only if, quote, the Lord and Master of them all should not, by any manifest declaration of his will, set one above another, and confer on him, by an evident and clear appointment, an undoubted right to dominion and sovereignty. End quote. Blacks were burdened by the curse which, according to the Old Testament story, Noah had uttered against Ham and his descendants. 
this ideological motif, often invoked by defenders of the institution of slavery, seems also to find some echo in Locke. There is no doubt the English liberal philosopher legitimized the racial slavery that was being established in the politico-social reality of the time. Subject to ever more onerous conditions, the practice of emancipation tended to disappear, while, together with the neutralization of religion and baptism, laws prohibiting interracial sexual and marital relations sanctioned the insurmountable character of the boundary between whites and blacks. At this point, the category of contract can serve to explain only the figure of the servant, while the slave is such as a result of right of war, more precisely, just war, of which Europeans engaged in colonial conquests are protagonists, or of a divine, quote, manifest declaration. In order to clarify the difference between the perfect condition of slavery and that of the indentured servant, Locke referred to the Old Testament, which provides for permanent hereditary slavery only for Gentiles, excluding from it servants who are blood relations of the Hebrew master. The Old Testament line of demarcation between Hebrews and Gentiles is configured in Locke as the line of demarcation between whites and blacks. Servants of European origin are not subject to, quote, perfect slavery, which is intended for blacks and repressed to the colonies. End section.